Welcome back 2021ers. This week's lecture will focus mainly on program performance and so-called micro-optimizations. Just a few updates in terms of what we're about. Uh, recently I've released Project 4 and I'll post a separate video surveying some specific elements of that, very likely in the next day or so. Be having a look at the specification and formulating questions and inquiries about that. If you're reading along at home, you'll want to have a look at Brian and O'Halloran, uh, Chapter 5, which discusses the kinds of optimizations that we're going to talk about now. Their terminology is that these are program optimizations, uh, whereas I'll refer them to micro optim or refer to them as micro optimizations, and the reasons for that will be apparent uh, very shortly. And we'll cover that today in our discussion of when it's an appropriate time to optimize things. You can expect a lab this week will visit some of the topics that we're discussing uh, and compare and contrast some of it uh, to the memory optimizations that we've discussed uh, uh, in the recent past. It's also the case that we have this full week to work on this and Monday, Wednesday we'll begin reviewing so that next Friday uh, we can be prepared for the third exam. Project 4 itself isn't due until after uh, that exam uh, the following Monday. To begin our discussion, the first caution you should sort of experience when someone asks you to or you feel the urge to optimize your code in some way uh, is to consider the following trade-offs uh, that optimizing programs usually costs human time. The goal there is to consume fewer resources, usually CPU time, uh, but CPU time itself is not particularly expensive these days. And your time as a programmer is quite expensive, uh, as once you get out there and start working, you'll, you'll find out you'll never have enough time to do all the things that you want to do or even need to do at, at times. Um, so on that front, uh, it's usually the case that optimization should be treated as this sort of last resort or uh, sort of low priority item uh, that it really should be. Uh, that always, in every sort of situation, your first and most important metric for whether uh, your code is good or not is, does it work? Does it produce correct results? Never ever sacrifice uh, correctness uh, for speed on that front. Uh, and uh, the first make it work, then make it right part of this is usually all that we have time for. The then make it fast portion is uh, something that uh, comes later as need de demands it. Uh, and this second quote I think is uh, very uh, interesting. One of the early Unix developers, uh, Ken Thompson, uh, had was quoted as saying, when in doubt, use brute force. Uh, and his advocacy there for using simple approaches that you are very confident will work correctly, um, this goes in line with the first make it work, then make it right part, that if you don't know a clever algorithm to do something fast, just do something that is fairly obvious you to, to work. And we'll see some examples of that later and then refinements of it. Uh, finally, we'll talk about this later in our discussion, is that if you must uh, optimize things, uh, then there are a lot of tools that can make it easier for you to determine where your efforts are best spent. Uh, tools that benchmark your code to tell you uh, whether it's fast in certain regions and slow in others, uh, and these include things like profilers, they can really direct your efforts so that you don't spend time optimizing things that are all running, uh, already running uh, reasonably fast. So in order of impact, if you decide I must optimize at this point, Generally, you follow this uh, track of highest level sort of program structure type things uh, to lowest level uh, things. Uh, and all of you should have taken some sort of data structures and algorithms class at this point and begun your study to understand that at a high level, your selection of data structures and the algorithms that operate on them, these are the most significant uh, elements to choose uh, that will impact the overall performance of your, your code. Uh, taking something from a quadratic or ON squared to a linear performance, uh, ON, will defeat any other optimizations that you might do at a lower level uh, down here. Uh, and that sort of uh, attacking a problem with uh, an algorithm that has a fundamentally different approach uh, that takes less time is always going to be better uh, than the kinds of code tweaks that we can get uh, later on. 
Uh, to that end, one of the godfathers in uh, the computer science realm, uh, Donald Knuth, uh, he is oft quoted as saying, premature optimization is the root of all evil. Uh, and that if you select good algorithms, then a lot of the rest of this is probably not good. Uh, and Ken Thompson would probably back that off uh, even further and just say something like, well, uh, prematurely optimizing by trying to fix uh, pick a fancy data structure and algorithm is not worth it until you realize you really need uh, that there. At any rate, uh, this is the first and best thing uh, to, to uh, attempt to do to change your code uh, to make it work better. It's also the thing that is probably the toughest because you might have to learn a new algorithm or do some research to figure out what is a better approach uh, to whatever it is that I'm, I'm working on. Dig out that copy of uh, Corman et al., uh, the big fat uh, data structures and algorithms book uh, that is uh, used in 4041 and read through some of those later chapters uh, that discuss uh, some of the things that are beyond the scope of what you might cover in a standard run of the course. At any rate, uh, beyond that then, anything you can do to eliminate unneeded work and hidden costs, uh, this is uh, very important. We'll see some examples of what I mean by that uh, too. And usually is what this is where optimization uh, finishes, that if you are uh, picking good algorithms and doing as little as possible to get the job done, uh, then your code is usually going to clip along at a good rate. Beyond that, we've also discussed that utilizing memory is an important facet of all programs. And if you're working on big data, the order that you visit memory and the efficiency with which you exploit cache uh, is a very important aspect that's associated with computing. And we've seen some examples of that in discussion of summing across rows, which is down columns, and you'll be working with that in a project uh, presently uh, to optimize what's otherwise a poor pattern of visiting memory and push that into uh, a pattern that favors cache and therefore improves performance. Only after doing all of these things is it worthwhile to consider what the textbook calls optimizations uh, but are really uh, micro-optimizations, as in uh, they do little code tweaks uh, that we'll see the compiler can oftentimes do for you, uh, which yield sometimes surprising changes in, in terms of speed. Uh, so to riff on what uh, Donald Luth was saying, uh, what, a lot of what Chapter 5 and Brown and Howron talks about are things that you shouldn't bother with uh, until it's very clear that you've exhausted other possibilities and it's really necessary to eke out that last bit of performance. And people oftentimes overlook the context for which this quote was made. Uh, that uh, Newth had this sort of long discussion of uh, the negative impacts of attempting to optimize at first uh, and that it's not worth it in terms of the correctness and debugging effort and stuff, which he ends with premature optimization is the root of all evil. Uh, unfortunately, immediately after that, uh, the uh, sort of phrase concludes, yet we should not pass up our opportunities in that critical 3%. Um, this is that 3% of opportunities or, or positions in which it really is worth the while uh, to spend some effort uh, to do some micro optimizations. And so we're going to focus for the next week on these uh, sort of code tweaks and use a lot of the tools that we've established before. But it'd probably be only about 3% of the time uh, that you'd find yourself in a working position where it's necessary uh, to utilize the knowledge that you'll acquire here. All right, to start this whole rigmarole out, here is an example of a young programmer named Prima. And Prima, uh, he is asked by her, or sorry, she is asked by her boss uh, to optimize the performance of the following C code that's over here uh, called getmin. And the name there is not meant to be misleading. It is really getting the minimum of something that's in some sort of a data structure here. Uh, Prima immediately identifies that there's a function call in here called bubble sort, uh, and after zealously studying the Brighton Halloran chapter 5, uh, jumps into that code and starts rearranging loops uh, because she knows uh, this can potentially lead to better uh, 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 processor pipelining, has, exploits uh, the architecture in there, and makes use of some of the techniques like loop unrolling that we'll talk about later. And this leads to an overall 2.5% improvement in speed. Uh, now, Prima might be somewhat happy with this, but all of you are probably slightly more clever uh, about what should really have been done here and how Prima's time would be better spent uh, optimizing this code. 
So take a minute and analyze it. And it's true that not everything in here is immediately available to you, but uh, it should be the case that you can come up with some ideas uh, of some alternatives that might have done uh, Prima a little bit, um, gotten her a little bit more performance out of this code or a lot more uh, for that matter. Take a moment, uh, think about this, and then we'll resume in a, uh, just a few moments uh, with a discussion of what I think are the important steps to take. All right, that should be long enough to pause if you're so inclined to actually think about this on your own. I'd first start uh, by mentioning that there is this opaque data structure up here, storage T. We have no idea what kind of thing this is. Uh, it clearly stores something, and there are some functions like a get element uh, and get size uh, associated with it. But you can think of it as some arbitrary data structure that stores some stuff. Uh, and Prima's general approach, or uh, the general approach that Prima finds in this code, uh, is that she sees uh, there's this array R, uh, and it's malloc in order to get integers out of this thing. So whatever it is, it's storing integers. Uh, those are acquired by going through the entirety of that data structure using this uh, get size to determine how big it is, and get elements uh, from it in order to get elements out of it, uh, and then plopping those down in the array. Then this bubble sort routine is called, which sorts things, uh, which should place then the smallest element at the zeroth index of that array. We don't need the array anymore because we've acquired the smallest element uh, and we'll return it. Now, Prima is maybe not wrong to focus her attention on this bubble sort because most of you will have studied different kinds of sorting algorithms in your preliminary CS education and we'll have heard allusions that there are a lot of different algorithms to sort numbers that are stored in an array. And as you would take CSI 4041, you'll study those in some more theoretical detail uh, and find out that they have different algorithmic complexities. And a very important set of screening questions in any interview is, are you aware of some of the differences between these uh, sorting algorithms? Uh, there are a bunch of O n squared sorting algorithms, and bubble sort is among them. Uh, others are like insertion sorts and selection sorts, and generally they have a pair of nested loops uh, that sort of go through and rearrange elements. They square, uh, they uh, sort of scale quadratically, and so uh, scaling performance as the array that they sort is is pretty bad. Instead, you'd want to go to more efficient sorting algorithms. Uh, and among those, every computer scientist should have at least one that they understand very thoroughly, if not all that they understand very thoroughly. And so if you aren't aware, you should go out and look up a few of these and begin your study of them, knowing that if you are in a CS curriculum, uh, 4401 will cover them in more detail. But just substituting bubble sort with something like quick sort, which is an n log n sorting algorithm, and it happens to have a built-in implementation in the standard C library, this would save a considerable amount of time uh, here because quicksort is an uh, n log n or uh, sort of sub n squared sorting algorithm. Uh, this will improve performance even more as the size of this thing gets bigger. Other good choices here, uh, which are in the n log n sorting category, are things like heap sort uh, or merge sort. And different programming environments will provide some default fast sorting algorithm that probably comes from one of those uh, three different sorting algorithms. So just changing the sort here, which is probably a one line uh, adjustment to not call bubble sort, but to call something else, involves no code effort work on uh, Prima's uh, part uh, to sort of improve the efficiency of the sorting algorithm and automatically goes from uh, one complexity class uh, quadratic and squared performance down to n log n performance. Uh, and that is probably gonna be a significant impact uh, as the arrays get bigger. But that's not really where the sort of best of this uh, is, is, uh, uh, effort is probably spent because it doesn't actually address like the fundamental approach of this uh, algorithm uh, very much, this getmin algorithm, in which we decided we need to sort. And anybody who thinks more than two seconds about this will realize like, oh, well, I'm already scanning the entirety of this uh, data structure uh, and then sorting it. I don't actually need to sort in order to find an Ill, uh, a minimum if I am scanning the entire thing. And so an, another approach would be, here's a loop that's clearly uh, traversing the entire data structure, getting elements. Just assign some minimum element here to the zero thing in here and go from one uh, up to size, uh, comparing if this element is smaller than the element I have in hand, then assign a new minimum. 
This completely alleviates the need to sort at all uh, and takes you from an n log n best case for sorting uh, down to a, whatever a traversal is. And it's usually linear with these get kinds of methods here. Uh, to that end, we've gone down yet another complexity class because uh, this bubble sort, which is n squared, we can change it to an n log n sorting algorithm, but a scan of the data is usually linear. Now, I say usually, uh, but that's not always the case because depending on what kind of data structure this is, there are some kinds of gets which are nonlinear. And importantly, you'd want to maybe start to investigate this storage T to find out what kind of data structure it is. The kinds of um, uh, data structures that have linear gets are your array and hash table type uh, data structures. Uh, on the other hand, you all know that if this storage T is some sort of a linked list, then repeatedly traversing that list in order to get the ith element, uh, that's a linear expenditure per, and so it would make this loop uh, n squared instead. But there are certainly uh, alternatives and efficient ways to traverse linked lists that might involve uh, breaking this loop into a set of pointers and uh, pointer chasing across the lengths of the linked list, uh, which would make it linear. And so the, after sort of deciding I understand the algorithm here, it's a scan, you'd want to consider whether or not accessing the data structure from the outside like this uh, using the get is really the best approach or if you should break inside the data structure just a little bit. But also then it should be obvious that there's no need to allocate an entire array up here uh, to store the elements of the storage, uh, the, the data structure that instead, if I'm traversing the elements of it and just fishing out one at a time in order to find a minimum, there's no need for this array up here. And so I don't need to free it uh, that instead this scan pretty much says it all. Finally, it is the case that some kinds of data structures actually store their elements in some sort of an order. And if it's the case that this is a sorted array already, there's probably no need to even scan the elements that the zeroth element is gonna store the, uh, the, that smallest elements are right off the bat. There are other kinds of data structures uh, such as uh, binary search trees that have a designated location in which uh, you could find the smallest elements. And that we found not by traversing the entire data structure, but in the case of a binary search tree, you start at the root and just keep going left until you find the leftmost element, which is where the um, minimum element is gonna be located. That would be an order log n search because if it's a balanced binary search tree, the height will be logarithmic. Uh, and so you don't have, you don't have to look at all of the elements. Uh, there are even some data structures that don't store things in sorted order, but instead store them in some uh, other partial ordering, which can make it easier to find uh, the minimum elements. Uh, you'll study in 4041 something called a binary heap that always also has its uh, zeroth element as the smallest thing if it's a min heap. Um, so to that end, knowing more about this data structure and how you can exploit the data that's present in the organization that it establishes, uh, this can lead to much better speedups. And I guarantee if you do any of the things that we've discussed, you'll get better than 2.5% uh, on that front. So uh, at any rate, uh, this kind of an approach, uh, while common in the sort of object oriented, I'm not gonna break out of any of the abstraction barriers that are imposed by the storage T over here. Um, usually it doesn't lend itself well uh, to the kind of uh, optimization that we're gonna talk about going forwards. And in the name of, the sp of speed, you oftentimes start breaking things down that constitute good software engineering um, in order to achieve a better performance, that there's usually a trade-off there on that front. Uh, so I think we uh, sort of surveyed most of the elements here, uh, but you can review them at your leisure. So I mentioned a moment ago this uh, idea of um, eliminating unneeded work. And in the case that we just outlined, uh, if you go to a scan of the data structure, there's no need to allocate an array uh, that could hold all the elements that are in it uh, and sort it, that the scan itself is sufficient to do that. Uh, this comes up in all kinds of surprising places, and Brian and O'Halloran have a particular exercise and figure which is associated with this. Uh, the two functions up here are sample implementations of a, a lower function, and there is a built-in C function called uh, lower or to lower or something like that, well, which will modify a string so that all of its characters uh, are smaller, uh, or the lowercase versions of that, and these are ASCII ranges. Um, the left-hand version of this over here 
uh, reads more or less as follows. Uh, in order to count for very long strings, uh, we'll use an index variable i, if that's a long, uh, and iterate up to the length of the string, uh, and just look for characters that are in a certain ASCII range, uh, where the ASCII code is greater than or equal to that of capital A, or less than or equal to that of capital uh, Z. Uh, and if it's in that range, then subtract off something from the ASCII code. Uh, it's, uh, the ASCII codes are oriented such that um, this quantity, uh, the difference between capital A, which is earlier, uh, or sorry, uh, earlier? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, or earlier in the alphabet, uh, in the ASCII codes, and the lowercase a, which is uh, later, uh, that will lead to a difference uh, that you subtract off. It'll be a negative difference, so you actually add on to it. Um, at any rate, um, you're making the same change to any of the uppercase letters because the distance between a uh, low, uppercase A and lowercase A is the same as between uppercase B and lowercase B. This is a nice trick that um, you know, hits on the structure that's built in that ASCII table. At any rate, um, we're making changes out there to this thing. Over the right hand side is a slightly different version of that and you can see the main loop over here uh, has the same logic in it. The only difference uh, is up here there's a mysterious call to Sterling uh, at the beginning. Um, have a look at these codes and calculate what is the algorithmic complexity, the big O complexity of the two lower one and two lower two functions. Uh, which one do you expect will run faster? All right, so tricks aside, what you should focus your attention on is that here there's a call to Sterling in the loop, and here there's a call to Sterling that's outside of the loop. And this is significant because it's an uh, oft overlooked fact that Sterling itself is a linear algorithm, that it essentially will treat the characters in the string as an array, and just iterate to say, is the zeroth one a null? Nope, is the oneth one a null? Is the tooth one a null? And keep going like this uh, across uh, the characters until it finds a null terminating character at the end of the string. This is how a lot of string algorithms in the C standard library works, uh, including printf, which will print a character if it's not null, move ahead, print a character if it's not null, uh, and keep going until it finds a null. Uh, that's the notion of that percent %s in printf. So Sterling here is important because in the left-hand version, it gets called every time we calculate whether or not to continue the loop. And this condition here, uh, the semantics of it, are to do this thing first, to check this every loop iteration to see if it should continue, and then to do at the end of each loop iteration this little I++. Now, that means that every loop iteration, I'm doing a little constant work here, but my check in order to determine whether I continue is linear in the length of the string. So every time I iterate, if I have a longer string, it'll take me longer uh, to determine where that null character is at and whether I should continue the iterations. Alternatively, we can move that check up here because we don't expect the string to be changing length in this code. We ask once uh, for this very long string, it'll take me 100,000 steps to find the null character, but then it's a constant check each time that this i less than len variable will just compare two registers very likely. Uh, and this brings me down from what would be a quadratic complexity over here to a linear complexity over here. Uh, you'll see that over here uh, with the sample implementation of Sterling here, uh, which just has a while loop that checks if the length character is null or not and continues until it isn't. And the little diagram over here comes out of Brian O'Halloran's uh, text, uh, which talks about the number of CPU seconds it takes uh, to two lower uh, various strings using approach one and approach two. Uh, lower one square, uh, scales quadratically, as in as the string gets longer, you get this parabolic effect uh, where I'm going up in, in terms of uh, the complexity and time versus uh, the uh, two lower two, which puts the Sterling check outside of it. Uh, it's faster, uh, both from the get-go, and as it gets long longer, uh, it seems to stay constant down here, but it's really uh, sort of linear in complexity. It's just uh, that this one takes so much longer in that, that respect uh, that uh, the differences look almost flat uh, down here. Uh, so to that end, this is a kind of hidden cost that you need to be very cognizant of as you program. And good programmers, uh, while they may not know all of the internals of every library function, uh, they'll investigate when needed and have at least a strong instinct about whether certain things are um, fast or slow, are linear or quadratic or constant in time. 
This is one of the failings of the C uh, sort of standard library and the approach to characters that uh, strings themselves don't carry their link with them. And it's why languages like Java and OCaml and Python, uh, they have adopted a more sort of structured data element that is a string that always carries its length with it, uh, so you can ask how big it is in constant time rather than uh, having to call some library function that scans through it in that front. Our last exercise uh, for today uh, is to discuss uh, the following, uh, which is uh, sort of lead into later discussions, um, which uh, has to do with whether or not memory references matter. Uh, so on that front, uh, the exercise is to contrast these two different uh, bits of code to determine whether or not we expect uh, the one to outperform the other. They again are both doing the same thing, uh, summing ranges uh, and from some start element to some stop element, and they're going to add uh, up all those elements and plop down the answer at the uh, memory address that's indicated by this little ants pointer here. And you can see uh, both of those uh, approaches over here. They start out with some sort of an ants uh, equal to zero or, or a sum variable equal to zero and just goes through a tight loop uh, to add things on. The primary difference between them, as you look at it, is in how this little ants uh, variable is used. Um, so take a moment and consider whether or not you expect these two to have wildly different performances or not. Uh, and if so, why would you expect them to have performances? Which one would you expect to run faster on that front? Take a minute uh, and we'll go back, get back to you in just a second. All right, so if you hadn't keyed in on the difference, uh, then it's in the loop itself in which, uh, in the left-hand approach, sum range one, uh, ants here is dereferenced every time and has a I added onto it. Versus on the right-hand side, I've decided I'm going to allocate a local variable sum, total into that, and then uh, do one single dereference at the end. We talked about the memory system uh, with, uh, for a considerable time, and this dereference is actually a request to please plop this thing down, this value in i, add it on to whatever uh, memory location it, uh, ants points to, I add all that value on there. And importantly, this will probably be a sort of combination of dereference as in obtain what ants actually stores, uh, add it on i to it, and write it back to main memory. And if this happens every loop iteration, then there's the great danger that you start hammering on the memory system and this will slow your computation down considerably. Very likely uh, the memory associated the, with wherever Anne's points gets cached, but it's still going to create a lag uh, in most cases as you would um, plop something down uh, in main memory. Uh, this still interacts with something that isn't in registers. Versus over here, it's very likely that everything up here is going to be uh, accounted for in registers. Sum is in a register, I is in a register, uh, stop is in a register, uh, and the adding here happens in a very tight loop similar to the performant ones that we looked at earlier. Uh, and the only interaction with the main memory system is over here where we write back a single time how that ends. And so uh, there's a strong suspicion that hitting memory here is probably going to have a performance impact, and it does in most cases. Uh, so what we'd want to do to determine this uh, definitively is to ask, well, if I compile these codes and run them on a very long range right here, uh, what do I get in terms of performance? Uh, and to that end, I've done so for you, although in two interesting ways. Um, the first way up here uses your standard debug level optimizations. And there, our suspicion is very much confirmed uh, that sum range one versus sum range two, they take different amounts of times when you sum over a very large range. Uh, and there's a substantial difference that sum range one uh, takes two some seconds. Uh, this is on a Linux desktop uh, that is sitting in my office unused at the moment. Uh, versus sum range two takes only about uh, 0 0.27 seconds. And you'll want to pay attention here to the multiply by a uh, power of 10 here. This is multiplied by uh, 10 to the zeroth power. So this is two uh, versus 10 to the minus one. So this is uh, 0.269 seconds. Uh, that's almost a fourfold uh, decrease is 25% or, or, or sorry, about uh, an eightfold uh, increase in time going from sum range one to sum range two. Uh, 
Uh, and what you'd look at in terms of the assembly that this sum range one function would compile to using these debug level optimizations uh, is exactly as expected. And you're in a good position to having study assembly to understand uh, here's this little uh, function. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of code, so you can actually fit most of it in your, uh, your brain at a moment. There's a body to the loop uh, and you uh, sort of loop back around at the top of that loop. Uh, and at each uh, point, uh, you're going to be checking something uh, to see uh, if uh, you should continue looping. If not, jump back up to the beginning of the, the um, loop and do this addition of whatever this EDI value is. Uh, that's the I value, I think. Uh, add it on to some memory location where uh, RDX uh, is located. So RDX here is this uh, ANTS uh, value over here, third argument uh, to the function. And so very much as expected, uh, I am hitting main memory every loop iteration here, and this is apparently costing me time. Now, interestingly, the compiler itself can make some optimizations. Uh, and to that end, turning on even the lowest level optimizations, dash 01 over here, uh, they make a, a, a significant uh, performance change in terms of the assembly code that's generated. And if you just time this, as in optimize not at the debug level, but really actually optimize, not for debugging experience, but more for perform performance, uh, then you'll see that these two times become much, much closer together, both in the fractions of a second uh, category now. You don't need to look too far to understand why the performance has improved too much because uh, as you would examine the assembly stream that's generated now for some range one, uh, it looks very much like what you'd expect for some range two, where the compiler is figure out like, oh, uh, within this loop body, it's actually a bad idea to hit the main memory every time. Uh, and so to that end, I am going to uh, introduce a local variable that will cache that results. Uh, I'll call it EAX. So I'm going to move a zero in there, and each time I'm going to add on this to this register instead. Now this is not a strict interpretation of the C code that I wrote anymore, that here uh, in C I mentioned I want uh, this to write back to main memory, uh, but the compiler has actually subverted that somewhat and says, yeah, I'll eventually uh, write back uh, to main memory uh, down here uh, towards the end of your code. Uh, but until I get there, uh, while I'm in the loop, I'm going to do every, all of my business in registers on, on that front. Uh, and so to that end, uh, these two codes then that you'd expect for some range one and some range two at the assembly level, when you're compiling with optimizations on, they look very similar to each other. Now this is the kind of code that up here that you could write by hand over on the right hand side and probably should in this case. Uh, but it should then be sort of interesting to folks to understand that the compiler is taking some liberal translations of the code that you wrote over here uh, and actually not interpreting it in quite the way that it's written. Uh, that this uh, dereference is usually thought of as a main memory access, uh, but in the assembly that's generated in the optimized version of it, uh, it's not anymore. And to that end, we'll spend some more time later on uh, discussing these ins and outs associated with the compiler and the optimizations that it can do on your behalf so that you don't always have to write code uh, that's different. Uh, one thing that I want to emphasize right now is that this kind of a micro-optimization uh, is a code transformation. And that code transformation is at such a low level that you can actually code algorithms in the compiler to do it for you automatically. Uh, and to that end, uh, it's very useful uh, and oftentimes sort of alleviates the need for you to do lots of little rearrangements like, like this. Uh, oftentimes the compiler can figure out those uh, uh, better uh, for, for you and having clean looking code is, is probably better anyway. Uh, that said, on the right hand side here, this is probably a better uh, sort of uh, set of code anyway. But I want to conclude uh, just by mentioning that uh, we discussed early on this hierarchy of optimizations, and it's only at this bottom level, the micro optimizations, that the compiler can really help you out in that respect. The other levels, uh, even as high as memory utilization and certainly uh, eliminating unneeded work uh, and selecting proper algorithms and data structures, this is really where good computer scientists are needed, uh, that the compiler is, in most cases, not smart enough to vastly rearrange the order that you visit memory in. And in some cases, it can eliminate unneeded work, but not at the sort of layer level that it will make a lot of difference. And certainly, there's no compiler out there that is smart enough to say, oh, I see you're using a linked list, and you should probably use a binary search tree. Uh, instead, I'm going to automatically convert all your code for you on that front. There is no such sufficiently smart uh, compiler out there right now.
And so the programmer effort is better spent at these top layers, uh, and the compiler can usually help you out with this micro-optimizations part. We'll talk some more about the techniques uh, that folks historically have used to do micro-optimizations, uh, and are now baked largely into the compiler, uh, and when it's appropriate to make use of those. Uh, but that's all I have for you at the moment. Uh, we'll pick up probably on Wednesday with discussions of more elimination of hidden work uh, and get to everyone's favorite loop unrolling eventually. I also have a separate video discussing Project 4, uh, which I'll uh, release very soon. Uh, and until then, I hope everyone stays happy and healthy. Happy hacking till we meet again. <laughs>